recording. The recorder is started. Um, what we'll be talking about today is binary comparison, okay? Because it'll be kind of touched on, you know, why we have signed versus unsigned representation. It is because sometimes we want to be able to represent, you know, uh, integer values that can go negative, and other times we do not. Um, so if we don't need to represent values that are negative, we can use the representation for the negative side also to the positive or the non-negative side, and therefore extending the range of the non-negative side of integers. Uh, most other programming languages do not uh, differentiate between signed versus unsigned. C, C++ are probably one of the few programming languages that offer the two flavors of integers, you know, signed versus unsigned. But in the processor, on the other hand, you know, there's definitely a distinction versus signed versus unsigned. And we have special mechanisms for comparing between those two. Because remember, on, when, on Tuesday, the very last part of the discussion was me asking you, why do you care whether the you know, 1101 is representing 13 as unsigned or representing negative 3 as signed? Do you guys vaguely remember that discussion? Okay. So the answer to that answer is until you have to compare and use the result of the comparison to make a decision of which branch to go, you really don't need to know because addition and subtraction, the mechanism that we have talked about, actually works on both you know, signed versus unsigned numbers. Did I get a chance to illustrate you know, how that works? You know, both you know, the mechanism that we have talked about you know, with um, binary addition and subtraction, it works on both your signed versus unsigned numbers. I may not have a chance to talk about that. Okay, so we'll do, we'll do that first today. So we'll go ahead and give us, a, you know, an example, okay? So we'll, I'll, I'll try to see what is the best way to do it. I think I can use a code block here to do that. That makes it a little bit easier for me to type on this side. All right, so we'll go ahead and um, specify a binary subtraction. And then we'll use this to illustrate you know, why the same mechanism works for both signed versus unsigned representation. So we'll go ahead and leave some space here. And the three digits that we are going to work with, we'll start with uh, 0, 1, 0, okay? And we are going to subtract from that number. Um, let's do 1, 1, 1, okay? All right. So the way we name these rows is, you know, this is x, which is also known as the minuend of the subtraction. This is y, which is also known as the, what is the term of the quantity to subtract from the subtrahend? Very good. Okay. <clears throat> now, is it really important that we know those terms? I would say yes, okay, because you know, sometimes I would just refer to those terms in the class and you really need to know what I am actually talking about. Okay, and then we have a difference at the very end here. I don't know why the columns are not aligning, but we'll, we'll deal with that later. All right, so the first thing is we want to shift to the method of using binary operation. So that means you know, we are looking at this particular digit where the linky cursor is. Oh, the other side doesn't look too good, but that's okay, just the color. So, this is actually, you can look at it two ways, okay? You can look at it as the single digit difference of zero minus one in base two. But you can also just look at it as the exclusive or between the zero and the one, okay? So I'm gonna use the binary or the Boolean way of looking at things. So this is gonna be a one, and this is gonna be a zero, and this is also gonna be a one, okay? Because I'm looking at things from the perspective of logic gates, and from the perspective of logic sum. So that's why we end up with one, zero, one here. And then here we have, oh, okay, that's not what I meant. That is not what I meant. Okay, so here we have to look at this and go like, okay, where, you know, what should go here? Um, this is T0, so T0 is usually assumed to be zero, okay? Unless there's a good reason why it should not be zero. So that's not a big problem. But T1, on the other hand, is, okay, from the binary perspective, it is the negation of this bit and this bit, but the negation of zero already gives you a one, so that means we have one and one. Or 
whatever this is. Okay, I'm not sure why this is not. Oh, okay, the, it just doesn't line up. Give me a second here to fix that. Okay. I just need to line up things. There we go. I think it used a tab character somewhere, and that's why it didn't line up. All right, so to figure out what goes here, which is T of 1, we have to look at the negation of x0 and y0, which is already a 1, but that is going to be or with the negation of q0 and t0. But since you know this is a 1, so that means you know, the negation is a 0, then we have 0 and 0, which is also a 0. So we have 1 coming from these two bits, or 0, which is coming from these two bits. 1 or 0 is 1, so that means you know, we have a 1 over here. Is that okay? Okay, so this is something that we have talked about at least you know, two classes ago. So by now, I'm hoping you guys you know, have spent at least spent some time to practice it, to practice this on your own so that you have a little bit of mastery on you know, these particular calculation. So now we need to figure out you know, what goes here. Same idea. Okay, the negation of this one, which is x1 and which is, so, so the negation of a one is a zero. 0 and this 1 is a 0. On the other hand, q1 is a 0, so the negation of that is a 1. That one is ended with t of 1, which is also a 1. 1 and 1 is a 1, and because those two are ORed together, so that means it will be ended up with a 1 in this, at this position. And then over here, same deal, okay? We have the negation of this 0, which is a 1. 1 and 1 is a 1, and then it doesn't really matter what this one is because you know, it is just ORed. So that means we also have a 1 over here. So now when it comes time to calculate the D, it is the exclusive OR of the previous two rows. So now we can just say, okay, this is, um, this is a 1, this is a 1, this is a 0, and that is the end of the binary calculation. And I don't really like the red highlight, so maybe I can just convince, yep, there you go. I just have to say it's just regular text. All right. so. I hope there are no questions, but if there are any questions, go ahead and ask questions at this point of how the binary subtraction happens. Okay, not seeing any questions. So now we want to look at the actual value they are representing, okay? So I am going to you know, you know, specify a column here, which is VS, and another column here, which is VU. VS is the value signed, represented by the bit pattern, and the VU is the unsigned value being represented. So in this case, 0, 1, 0 is 2 in both cases, but in the case of 1, 1, 1, they are different. Because when it is a signed representation, this is a negative 1. When it is an unsigned representation, it is representing 7. Is that okay? Okay, so I'm hoping you guys remember you know, what the VS and the VU uh, functions are defined because you know, that's what I use, that's what you can use to figure out you know, what is the signed versus the unsigned value being represented by exactly the same bit pattern, which is in this case 111. So now we ask the question, is the result, does the result make any sense? So in this case, you know, 2 minus negative 1 is 3, and this is also 3 you know, here. So the answer is 3 in both cases. Then you go up. Uh, it doesn't make sense, Hack, because you know, 2 minus 7 is not a 3, it is a um, negative 5. Well, it is a negative 5, because we have an overall borrow of 1 here. So this overall borrow that is positioned here is at digit 3, which means it specifies a 1 of 2 to the power of 3, which is an 8. In other words, from the perspective of this entire calculation, it means, you know, from the unsigned perspective, it means, you know, the answer is a three, but we owe eight. So it actually does make sense. Is that okay so far? All right. Okay, so now, you know, given that we have this already as an example, we can now start to think about, so when we need to compare integers, uh, and we already know that the assigned versus unsigned does matter. How do we tell whether the minimum is less than the subtrahend? That's all we need to know. 
I don't really need to look at equality or less than or equal to or greater than or equal to because all of those can be derived if I already know how to determine whether a value is less than another value. I can use that combined with Boolean operators to deal with the rest of the comparisons. Okay, so in C++, less than or equal to, greater than, equal to, not equal to, all of those are called relational operators because they are basically saying, how does this value relate to this value? Uh, do they equal to each other? Is the first one less than the, uh, the second one? Is the first one greater than the second one? And so on. So that's why they're called relational operators. I can, you can also call those comparison operators you know, just you know, because I mean, that's all they do, they just compare. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of you know, how we can use one single thing, which is just less than, and derive all the other ones you know, as a result. Okay. <clears throat> so given that we can only perform you know, less than, um, let's see how we can do you know, all six. There are six of these. So we'll go ahead and look at each one. And I'm going to use the C notation here just so that it is clear what we are trying to implement. If we need to determine whether x is less than y, that's easy because less than itself is given to us, not a problem. What about x is less than or equal to y? Well, that becomes, okay, becomes, it becomes, you know, um, it is not the case that y is less than x. Okay, so let me, let's you know, just kind of pause here and I try to digest this a little bit. So are you guys convinced that if and only if x is less than or equal to y, that it is also the case that it is not the case that x that y is less than y. Give yourself a few values, okay? So let's just say that x is two and y is three, okay? So in this case, two is less than or equal to three is true. So in this case, three is less than two is false, but I negate that so it becomes true again. The, uh, the actual boundary case is when x and y are the same, okay? What if x and y are the same? If x and y are the same, then x is less than or equal to y is true. But if they are the same, then y is less than x is going to be false, and not false is true. So I have just spot checked a few cases. This is by no means an actual proof that you know, this equality works. <laughs> But you know, I'm hoping that you're convinced that, oh, okay, so there's a way to, uh, to check for less than or equal to using just less than, but using an additional negation in this case, let's say logical negation. All right, let's look at the uh, other one. I think this one is super easy, right? Uh, whoops, sorry. X is greater than Y becomes Y is just less than X. Uh, that one is easy. We just flip the two side and then flip the operator around. Okay, that's not difficult. Let's try some slightly more difficult ones. Okay, what if I'm looking for x does not equal to y? But all I can do is just less than. How do I work with this one? I, I see that it may be a little too early for this discussion. Yes. Yes, that is correct. Very good. I like that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and put that in here. So it becomes, you know, x is less than y or y is less than x. Done. All right. Very good. The last one is equality. So we'll go ahead and say, okay, how do we know that x and y are the same when all we can tell is less than whether one value is less than the other value. Yep. Exactly. So we take this, okay, and then uh, we'll do a paste here, and then we'll put an extra pair of parentheses and just negate this entire thing. <laughs> okay, it is a lazy way to do it, but it gets the job done. All right. So that means, you know, yes, we can get away with just knowing whether a value is less than another value, and we can use that to implement all of the other 
relational operators. Are we good so far? Okay. So math is important in a computer science class, and not just in this class. It is even more so after you guys transfer to a four-year university. So you know, it is good to kind of strengthen your sense of math, you know, when before you transfer, because you know, after you transfer, those classes, you know, I think they do get significantly more involved in on the math side. All right. So now that we have established this, okay, let's go back to the notes because you know this is this translates to you know what I just covered over here. All right, we talked about interpretive value. This is just a double exposure of what we have already talked about in signed versus unsigned uh, representation. So the way du is defined here and ds are defined are exactly the same as what we have already talked about. But you know, this morning I decided, well, let me try to highlight things, okay? You know, that are actually of importance, okay? I'm hoping that you know, after a few times like this, you guys would also be able to read the notes and be able to spot and kind of highlight the portion that is super important. Like in this case, you know, the definitions here are both you know, highlighted in a green box, okay? And you know, that's just me telling you, it's like, yeah, this is important. So what do you do with important stuff like this? Put it in your own notes. And on the same page, yes, very good. So you can probably do the same thing you know, with all the previous modules where I did not do the highlighting. Spot all the equations, spot all the definitions, and put all of those in one place. And there are plenty of those already at this point of this class. We're at the end of week three, okay? So there's a lot of stuff that we have already talked about, and there are a lot of definitions, a lot of your equations that you kind of you can put down you know, on that one page. It's not gonna fill up the page, okay, depending on how, what kind of uh, handwriting you have. I don't think it's gonna fill up one page, but there's a lot. Are we good so far? So I'm not gonna dive into the details of you know, what is on the screen right now, just because, yeah, we just talked about it on Tuesday. So I'm gonna go forward, okay? And this is important, okay, it says, in a binary subtraction of two m bit patterns, x and y, so in other words, we are subtracting uh, y from x in this case, tm equals one if and only if du xm is less than du ym, assuming t0 is a zero. Okay, it is a relatively long sentence, but the sentence itself does not have any big words. The question is, do we know what it means? Okay, you guys are good. If, okay, if anyone is thinking, well, that's your job, Tech, you know, you are supposed to explain to us what that means, I would say partially correct, okay? Because you know, part of what you guys need to do is to read this ahead of time and try your best to understand the material first. Now, if you go like, I can sort of understand it, I kind of get what it means, um, that's good, okay? Because now, you know, when I explained it with an example, everything would just click. On the other hand, if someone is going like, I have no idea what M means, you know, what is a bit, I don't know what is T of M, I don't know where the T is coming from, um, or what is DU, you know, then I would start to worry, okay? Because you know, that indicates you know, um, the knowledge is not, uh, that person you know, doesn't have the knowledge that it needs in order to succeed in this class. There's a difference between knowledge and the ability to apply the knowledge to solve a problem. So knowledge is definitely the first thing that we need to get, okay? How, whether you can use the knowledge to, to solve a problem, that's a second stage, okay? That's a separate kind, of, separate kind of deal. All right, so I'm going to go a little slow this time, okay? We'll explain what is T of M. What is T of M in the context of this box here? Yep. Because M as a subscript is indicating the position, and we already know the context of M because we're dealing with M bits in a in an M bit subtraction. So that M 
this m over here is referring to the width of the numbers that we are subtracting. And t is the borrow, you're correct. And this is the very, all, this is what we call, this is what I call the overall borrow, okay? And so now we understand what this is. So the rest is basically saying if the overall borrow is a one after a subtraction, it can happen if and only if du of xm is less than du of ym. So now the question is, what is du xm and du ym? It sounds like an offspring of Elon Musk. Okay, if you don't get that joke, it's okay. So. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't want to inspire him to name more of his kids, which he will have, you know, with these names. Okay, so BU is the unsigned interpretation of a bit pattern. The bit pattern is X in this case, and we are only interpreting up to M bits, which is okay, because you know, X is a bit pattern that only has M bits, okay? And you know, the same thing for VUYM, okay? It is the unsigned interpretation in the unsigned interpreted value of bit pattern by using M bits. Okay, so now that we understand you know, what those things are really are, so this is one thing that you can do in your notes, okay? If you're still having you know, a little bit of a struggle with, okay, I cannot recognize you know, these you know, particular names, I don't know what the context is, write it down, okay? You know, write down you know, my actual words of you know, explaining what VUXM and VUYM are so that you can read your own notes and go like, oh, okay, so that's what it is, and so on. Yes? So I just need to make sure I understand the VUXM and VUYM bit pattern. It's the unsigned value. Inter it's the unsigned interpreted value of the pattern X using M bits. That is the same definition that we have used in the previous class on Tuesday. Yep. Hmm? Um, I cannot remember which example I used on Tuesday. When we first came in, in that case, M would be three because those are three bit numbers. Okay, that's a very good idea, thank you. So that's a good idea, okay, because you know, we can just go back to here. Zero, one, zero being X means it has a VS, or the signed interpreted value is two. The unsigned interpret interpreted value is also two. But when, when it comes to Y, which has a bit pattern of one, 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 M is still three, okay? Those, those are both three bit numbers. But the signed interpreted, va interpreted value is negative one but the unsigned inter interpreted value is seven. Thank you. So excellent, excellent use of an early example, which I have totally forgotten already. I compare the way my mind works as playing Tetris. So my mind is focusing on twisting the blocks that are falling and fitting it into the row. So all the rows that I have cleared already, typically I have no recollection of, <laughs> even if it is within minutes. It looks like you have a question for a uh, hey. Eureka okay. moment. The Ds, yeah. they got the, those are just the numbers that are going to the two and the three. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yep. I was going to um, the first part, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one. And then you put the place over the zero, and T is the zero X. Or you put zero and T is zero X, but you get the one on the left side. You mean this one here? Uh, the one and T is a one. You mean here or here? Um, well, I explained that you know, when we went over this before you came, so it's probably a good idea to be on time. Um, so I really can't spend time to go back and re-explain things that I already explained. But the lecture is being recorded. And this is actually the material from binary addition and binary subtraction. So it links all the way back to that which is prior to the signed versus the unsigned uh, representation, okay? Um, right, so thank you for the reminder of the example. So this is what we mean, okay? 
So the question now is how do we apply that statement that we were focusing on before, which is, is duxm less than duym in this case? Well, if you look at t of m, m is 3, so t of m is this one here. Because t of m is a 1, that means duxm is indeed less than duym. Does that make sense? Yep, it does make sense because duxm is a 2, duym is a 7, 2 is less than 7 is 2. Is that okay? So this is by no means a proof of why this statement is true, okay? It is simply a single test case to show that, okay, the test case, the result of the test case is consistent with what I claim. But how do you know this is true in general? In other words, if you are given any bit pattern that is m bit wide, you do a subtraction, and the overall carry is a one, then you can automatically conclude that the unsigned interpreted value of x is gonna be less than the unsigned interpreted value of y. How can you be sure about that? It has to do with this entire section here, which is long and it is a little bit out of the scope of this class. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time to talk about what is proof by induction. If you have taken CISP 440, you probably can understand the proof itself, okay? So, you know, that would be a good exercise for those of you who have taken CISP 440 to kind of give yourself a kind of self-check of can I apply proof by induction in this context? What if you have not taken CISP 440 or you're taking CISP 440 this semester? It means wait until the end or wait until you are done with CISP 440. If you remember after that, you know, at that time, come back here and see if you can understand the proof. But for the time being, in this specific class, I show you the proof, but you don't have to do it, nor to completely understand the proof itself, because proof by induction is a topic in CISP 440. But I do want to link the material between the classes, because this is how you can combine the material of different classes so that you have a better understanding of the, everything in general. <clears throat> so I'm gonna skip the proof, okay? You know, because it's kind of long, it's kind of involved, it uses a lot of symbols. So we're gonna go all the way to you know, find less than, okay? So find less than is a little bit interesting because if you think about it, okay, um, right here. So if, it's, if it is a find less than, that means you know, x minus y can be negative and d is going to represent the negative uh, value of the difference between x and y, okay? So to give you guys an idea what I mean by that, let me just kind of replicate this part here and I'll give you an example. Um, how many rows do we have here? So four, seven, nine, okay? I'm gonna copy 10 of those. And stash it here. There we go. So I'm going to give you an example where it is a sign comparison and the sign is negative at the very end. So we'll go ahead and subtract. Um, oh, that will do. Okay, that's going to do it. All right, so this is also a good time for us to practice binary subtraction again. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of some of these and we'll change this, okay, because it's gonna change and this we don't know yet, so I'm gonna get rid of it. All right, <clears throat> so to address what you asked a little bit earlier, now is a good time for us to kind of practice binary subtraction again. Okay, this is another chance of practicing it. All right, so we have um, T of zero is assumed to zero because we do not have a prior subtraction and I can show you a little bit later of you know, why sometimes t of zero is not assumed to be zero because we can stack the adder or the subtractor and as a result, you know, that, you know, that way it's not gonna be um, zero. It cannot, you cannot assume it is a zero, okay? So the first thing is we want to deal with the row of q 
it is the exclusive or of the x and y bits. In other words, q of 2 is the exclusive or between x2, y2, and so on. So that means you know, I can just work on this row, you know, kind of all at once. It would be 0, 0, and 1 in this case. <clears throat> now what we want to work with p of 1. So now we have to remember, how is p of 1 defined? In other words, how is t of i plus 1 defined when i equals to 0? So hopefully that definition is somewhere on a sheet of your own notes. Because you know, it is not my job to write everything on a piece of paper so that I can remember the definitions. So it is your job to make sure that you know where to find the definition you know, as quickly as possible, okay? So I can just kind of talk about it. So T of I plus one is defined as B of uh, XIYI or B of QIPI. In the case of a binary number, B of XIYI is also known as not XI and YI. So I negate this zero, which becomes a one, and it with this one, which is one and one, which is a one. But since it is or with something else, it is already a one, so that means the or has to be a one. So that means you know, this is now known as a one. And when I move on to this one, same idea, except x1, not x1, and y1 is going to give me false. So now I have, to, I have to look at the second chance of making the or a one, which is q, not q1, and t1. q1 is a zero, so that means not q1 is a one. Then we have 1 and 1, which is a 1. So that means you know, the or is also a 1 in this case. So that's why I put a 1 over here. Same deal over here. <clears throat> the negation of x2 and y2 is going to give me a 0. But the negation of q2 and t2 is going to give me a 1. So once again, I put a 1 here. And now when we get to the d row, di is defined as the q of um, the D, D of I is the R of QI, TI. But the R function in binary subtraction is just exclusive OR, which means we look at the entire row of Q, we look at almost the entire row of Q, T, and it will just perform a bitwise exclusive OR. And there is such an operator in C and C++, that is the caret symbol, okay? The caret symbol in C and C++ is bitwise exclusive OR, okay, in case you guys want to know how what it is in C and C++. So that means this is a 1, this is a 1, this is also a 1. All right, so that's binary subtraction, which is at least two lectures ago. And now we want to look at the representation, which is one lecture ago. So this is a 3 in both cases, okay? And over here, it is a little different. Because the signed representation or this the signed interpretation of the bit pattern one 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 is negative one. We worked that out a little bit earlier, okay? <clears throat> and then the other one is still a seven because you know, that's the same that we worked out a little bit earlier. So now you have to ask the question of does that make sense? Well, I think it makes a lot of sense, okay? Two minus three is negative one. Yes, it makes sense. 2 minus 3 is a 7, but with an overall borrow of 8, that makes sense as well. So the overall borrow has no meaning when you're looking at a signed subtraction. Okay, and we, when you have a signed subtraction, the overall borrow, which is t of 3 in this case, has no meaning. You don't have to use it for anything. But what, we, what I want to illustrate here is the result is a negative one here. And that tells me that 2 is less than 3 from the signed perspective. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. Because in the signed interpretation, the difference can be negative. And that really helps a lot. So if I switch back to the notes here, okay, we'll kind of try to follow the math here. D is x minus y, okay. And Okay, let, let's go back here first. Okay, sorry, I, I kind of skipped a little bit ahead. X is less than Y if and only if Y, X minus Y, the whole thing is less than zero. So we'll just kind of focus on this statement here. Do you agree with this? In other words, 
do you remember in algebra? Okay, because what we do is if you have x some relational operator with y, then we can say, just say, okay, let's go ahead and subtract y from both sides of the relational operator. In other words, this doesn't have to be a less than, it can be greater than, it can be equal to, and so on and so forth. Because as long as we perform the same operation on the both sides of the expressions, then we still can maintain the relational operator of operation. So that means this side becomes x minus one, which is this. This side becomes y minus y, which is also this one, zero. Is that okay? Yes, the double-sided error means if and only if, okay? What does that mean? Okay. All right, do you guys have, a quest, have any questions back there? Yes. question was, in the example that I used a little bit earlier, why is, why do we have a 7 here? Because it is 1, 1, 1, and the B, okay, so the whole thing, why is, oh, that is not showing up because it's on the wrong part of this. Sorry about that. That is my, my bad, because you're, you're supposed to be able to see the VS versus the VU. So when you apply VU of the bit pattern 111 and a 3 as a, as a width, it will give you a 7. That has to do with how VU is defined. So does that explain why we have a 7? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that's basically you know, why we have a 7 is because this is the unsigned interpret interpretation of the bit pattern. All right. Very good. Okay, thank you for the reminder because you know, I forgot that you know, I put these two on the, on the wrong row in the uh, markdown notation. All right, switching back here. Now, this is important, okay? Because bit, min uh, bit m minus one after a subtraction or in any signed representation is called the sign bit, okay? Let me explain you know, what we are calling the sign bit. This is called the sign bit. It is called a sign bit because in the in the VS uh, formula, how is this particular bit used? Yeah. So it's just the power of the one. It is minus two. Yes, it is subtracted. Okay, it specifies whether we have a subtraction of two to the power of m minus one. Okay. So let me go back to the definition of VS, which is also in here. Okay, this is a repetition of you know, the, the signed versus unsigned thing. This is the most significant bit, okay? Why is the most significant bit at position M minus one and not at M? Why? It has to do with where we start counting. The first bit, the least significant bit is what? Is it bit one or is it bit zero? is bit zero, okay? So if the least significant bit is bit zero, that means the most significant bit of an m bit number is bit m minus one. Because bit m is already outside of the m bit numbers. Is that okay? All right? So this is the most significant bit, and the only thing that is done differently with the most significant bit is that is multiplied to two to the power of m, m minus one. But this entire product is subtracted from the rest of the summation. So now you have to ask the question, is that always enough to turn the number negative? In other words, if I have all ones, okay, in the entire number. In other words, this part here has, is adding up all the powers of two, you know, corresponding to that portion of the number. Is this one quantity, subtraction of this quantity, enough to turn the entire number to negative? The answer is yes, okay? 
So you can you can kind of run through a few quick examples to convince yourself. I can make a proof by induction about this too, if you guys want to. Um, so if anyone is interested in the proof by induction, you know, of why this works, you know, I can do that. But we can start with simple stuff like, what if m equals to one? You go like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, it does. Okay. So what happens when m equals one? Then we have this is i going from zero to m minus two of uh, x i two to the power of i <coughs> subtracted from the summation of i. Oh, sorry, this is not a summation. <coughs> this is just your x of m minus one, which is x zero times two to the power of zero. Is that okay? All I did is to substitute, um, what is it? Uh, yeah, so all I did was to, oh, m, okay, I forgot one more thing, you know, because we know what m is, so m minus two is negative one, there we go, okay. So what do we with the, do with this? This looks really funky, right? Because you know, this is a sigma notation where the beginning is less than the end. That means we don't do a single thing. It means this entire thing just go to zero, okay? What about this? Oh, we do have, you know, so let's say the binary number is just one. So in this case, x sub zero is this one, two to the power of zero is one, so we subtract the one, we get negative one. So that means with a one bit signed integer, you can represent zero or negative one. I know it sounds really funky, but that's how it works out, okay? So now we look at what if m equals to two, okay? So let's say m equals two. So now we are looking at the number one, one, okay? So this time we got something to do, a one thing to do in the sigma notation. So what do we get? Um, I goes from zero to zero. That's okay, okay? Because the end and the beginning can be the same. We only got one term in the sigma. So now we have x of one, x, excuse me, x of zero, which is a one, times two to the power of zero, which is one. One times one is a one, and that's the only term in the sigma. What about this term over here? Well, because we have m equals two, if m equals two, then m minus one is one. So we have x of one times two to the power of one. X of one is this one over here. Two to the power of one is two. The product is just two. Is that okay? That's also negative one. So you can kind of see the pattern of you know, where, how this, where this goes. It's, it doesn't matter how long or how wide you make the number. The one subtraction, because of the most significant bit, is always going to turn the value of the entire thing negative. Are we okay with that? Okay, because this is, at this point, I would call this an observation because I did not present the actual proof that this is the case no matter what m is. Okay, but I think you guys get the sense of yeah, we kind of get the idea. Okay, so how do we make use of this? Well, the, the way we make use of this is when you use a signed representation, then x of m minus one, this particular digit, is also called the sign bit. Because that alone can tell you whether the represented value using the signed interpretation is negative or not. Do you know the actual quantity just by looking at one bit? The answer is no. But can you tell whether it is negative or non-negative? The answer is yes. And that's the significance of the most significant bit. I know that sounds really odd, but this is the reason why it is important. Because that one bit, the most significant bit, can tell you whether the value being represented is negative or non-negative. Are we okay with that? Okay, all right. <clears throat> So getting back to the notes over here, okay, uh, the, so we're going back to here. So that means, oh, great. So that means if we look at D, because what is D? D exactly is the difference or the result of X minus Y. 
So if we know that D is negative, then we can automatically conclude that X is less than Y. Is that okay? All right. So let's look at the examples that we have already presented today and see whether that works or not. This one works because look at this one over here. The, the one that is highlighted is the sine bit of the difference. It is a one. And indeed, using the sine interpretation, two is indeed less than three. So it works out this time. What about the previous one? The previous one also works out because look at the sine bit here. It is a zero. It is a zero, which means two is less than negative one, is not true. That is correct as well. So it would seem that we now have an easy solution to determine whether the ds or the sine value represented by this pattern is less than the uh, sine interpretation of another value, another bit pattern. Because all we need to do is to look, look to, is to look at that one sine bit of the difference, and it will tell us the, the, the result. So just when you guys have all this hope, it's like, okay, that would be the end of this lecture, we are good. I'm gonna get some, I will throw a wrench, two wrenches into this whole thing. It's like, nope, not quite that easy. <laughs> As things usually are, it's not always that easy. So what I'm gonna do is I'll give you another example. Okay, so let me, I think it was like, what, nine, 10. Okay, well, I'll just copy 10 rows here, just to be sure. All right. Yep, okay. So I'm gonna give you another example, um, and you guys will go like, okay, that doesn't work out. Why is it not working out? So we'll go ahead and try, oh, all I need is to put a one here, and we can put a zero here just to simplify the calculation, and then we'll put question marks, again, you know, everywhere, so I can work out the entire thing. So get rid of this, get rid of this, and get rid of this. There we go. All right, we can work out the VS and the VU right away. What is the VS? There are two ways to look at this. The clumsy way is to make your wheel, okay, your number wheel, and then do the counting and you know, put all the labels. The quicker way is to use VS, okay? It has no one, it has one, two, and then subtract a four from the two. So what do we get? Negative two. Negative two, very good. So the signed value represented by this bit pattern is negative two. What, what about the unsigned value represented by the same bit pattern? It would be six, because it is two plus four. So it's a six here, this one is easy, it is just two in both cases, okay? So now we try to work out the binary subtraction, and I'm not gonna fully explain the process, you know, to kind of speed things up a little bit here. So this would be one, zero, zero. And it's a zero here, zero here, and also a zero here. So that's a one zero zero. And now we look at one zero zero and ask what is the signed interpretation of one zero zero? It's not zero, okay? Because we have yes, negative four. Because we have we have none of one, we have none of two, but we have a subtraction of four. So that means this is as negative as it can possibly get with a three bit signed integer. All right, and then with the other one, it is just <coughs> three. We do okay so far, okay? So there are a few things we want to look at this for. It's like the first thing is, okay, let's check for the unsigned one first, okay? Because the unsigned one is easy to interpret. Um, X is less than Y if and only if the overall borrow is a one. In this case, it's a zero, which means from the unsigned perspective, X is not less than Y. Six is not less than two. Okay, we are good. Okay? But then we also want to look at the sign interpretation, and at this point, we want to go for the easy route, which is, okay, we look at the sign bit of the difference. If the sign bit of the difference is a one, it can only be the case when the sign interpretation of X is less than the sign interpretation of Y. And in this case, it is negative two is less than two is true. Okay, so this one is not the exception that I was hoping for. Let me see, why is that the case? Because it can barely do it, darn it. Okay, it can barely do it. 
Okay, so I'm gonna change the example so that it cannot do it anymore. All I need to do is to change this to a one. So let's see what happens when that is changed to a one. So now we just redo the calculation here. This is one, zero, one. And now we have a one here and a one here and a one here. And then we also end up with, this would be a zero, this would be a one, this would be a one. Okay, so now I need to make some changes here. This is going to be three. This is also going to be a three. And this is going to be a three. And this is going to be a what? It is also three. That's right. So now we are in a pickle. If you look at the unsigned perspective, it still works. Good idea. Okay. I made a mistake. The mistake is this bit here. Because this bit is the negation of x and y. That would be a zero. And or the negation of q2 and q2, that would also be a zero. So that means I made a mistake here. I caught my own mistake because six is less than three is false. So the borrow bit should be a zero. So when I look at the borrow bit being a one, I go like, okay, something is not right. Okay. But what about the sign bit? What about this bit being able to tell us whether x is less than y from the signed perspective? Oh, it doesn't work anymore because negative two is in fact less than three, but yet the sign bit here is a zero. Are we doing with this so far with this observation that the sign bit in this particular case is not telling us the correct result of the signed comparison of is negative two less than three. But it worked before, why is it not working now? Why do you think it's not working now? Look at the actual value of the difference. Okay? Look at the sign of the actual difference here. We start off with negative two, and we are subtracting a non-negative quantity from a negative quantity. What do you think the difference should be? Is it going to be negative or non-negative? It should be negative. <coughs> and yet we have something that is non-negative. The reason is the actual result. Okay, tell me what is the actual result of negative minus two. Negative five. It's negative five. It's negative five within the range of values that can be represented by a three-bit number. No. The answer is no. Um, and by the way, what is that range? If I give you three bits to represent uh, a find number, what is the range of values that can actually be represented? Three. That is correct, okay? I would have said negative four to three, but same, okay? So that's correct. Yep, and negative five is out of that range. We have an overflow. Is that okay? All right, so we have an overflow situation which is causing the problem. There's another way to cause an overflow problem, so I'm gonna show you guys an example of the other way that we can end up with an overflow. So we'll go ahead and We'll just make another example. And this time I will start off with a non-negative value to begin with. And we're gonna subtract something that is negative from it. So it's gonna be one, I think one, one, zero would just barely trigger that, okay? So that's, we'd like to look at boundary cases, okay? Because boundary cases represent it's like, oh, so that is what is happening. So we'll rework the entire subtraction here. And this, all of these will be reworked because we, I just changed all the numbers. All right, so we're gonna look at the um, value represented by the bit patterns. Uh, this one is easy, right? Zero, one, zero, because the most significant bit is a zero, so that means the VS and the VU would be the same, which is just two, that's right? So we have two here, we also have two here. What about this one? It's negative two for signed representation, and what is it in unsigned representation? It's a six, that's correct. Okay, very good. Now we actually perform the binary subtraction itself. So the one thing I want to re-emphasize is we can perform the subtraction here using only the bit or the logical operations without actually thinking about 
oh, here's one minus one does indeed a ball. Okay, we don't have to think about that. We just apply the logical operation like the chip would have, okay? Like the computer processor would have. So this is just um, zero, uh, excuse me, one, zero, zero on here. And then here we have a zero. Here we have a zero. And here we have a one. And then over here we have one, zero, zero, okay? So let me see if that makes sense, okay? What is the sign interpretation of one, zero, zero as a three-bit sign number? Negative four, and this is just four. There we go. All right. So now we look at the sign, unsigned comparison first, okay? So from the unsigned comparison perspective, what we are looking for is really just looking at the overall borrow. The overall borrow is a one if and only if x is less than y. Is it consistent with what we claim? Yeah, yes it is, okay? Because the overall borrow is indeed a one in this case, and x is less than y from the unsigned interpretation perspective. So that works out. What about the signed perspective? The signed perspective looks at the uh, sign of the difference. This is a one this time. A one would indicate that the x, that x is less than y, okay? But in this case, what is x? x is two, y is negative two. Two is less than negative two, that's not right, okay? It is not, it's not true. And yet, the sign flag is telling me that it is. So once again, the sign is wrong about this whole thing, and the reason why it is wrong is once again, we overflowed, okay? This is an overflow situation, because what is the actual result of two minus negative two? It's four. And we talked about the range of a signed three-bit number just a little bit ago. What was the highest number it can represent? Three. So that means the difference is out of the range of what a signed number can represent using only three bits. That is the reason why the sign of the result is wrong. Is that okay? So now the question is, how can we detect that we have an overflow situation as quickly as possible. So the way it works is you look at the sign. We start off with a non-negative number in this case, and we're subtracting a negative quantity from a non-negative quantity. I don't care about the actual value. What should be the sign of the difference? Should it be non-negative or should it be negative? It should be non-negative. The fact that we are getting a the sign may be a one means that we have an overflow situation because that's, that sign has to be wrong. Is that okay so far? Okay. So I think you know, I can, okay, I can see some people going like, okay, I'm, I think I'm getting it, but I'm not quite 100% getting it. So let's see uh, what we have here as a table. Um, I want to think of a, Okay, this is x of, okay, I'm, I'm just going to go for the full representation here. So this is x, uh, the most significant bit of x, and then this is the most significant bit of y. Oops. And this is the most significant bit of the difference. And then this one here is to ask, does it make sense? There we go. So we are, we are making a table. And this table, how many rows do we have in this table? Assuming um, x, the most significant bits of x, y, and z are independent, how many rows should we have? Each one is a binary number, which means each one can be a zero or a one. And all the bits, you know, x, of n minus one, y of n minus one, and z of n minus one are independent. So how many rows should we have? Eight. We have eight rows, because it's two to the power of three, not times three. The reason why that is the case is because when x is one, uh, when, when x is zero, okay, so I'm gonna make four of these or three more of these. Oh, that didn't work. 
Then we have you know, the other ones you know, that can be of a different value. So now we can have you know, this one being a zero, this one being a, oops, zero, ah. Still trying to get used to this keyboard. There we go. Oh, this is gonna be a one, and this is gonna be a one. And then again, this is a zero, this is gonna be a one, this is gonna be a zero, this is gonna be a one. Okay, well, that's only when x of m minus one is a zero. So now we need to copy four of these and then change the, oh, okay, it didn't work that way. Ah. Okay. Now we have the whole table. I'm gonna decrease the zoom a little bit so that, just so that we can see the entire table. Is that okay? All right. So now we have to answer the last row, okay? These are the patterns, okay? These, these are the questions, okay? What happens in each of these cases? So now we have to ask, does it make sense for each of these rows? Let's look at the first one, okay? The uh, min of n, the subtract hand, and the difference, they are all non-negative. Can that happen? Quite easy, right? Three minus two is a one, they are all non-negative. So that means, yep, it can happen, and it does make sense. All right, so we have a non-negative number minus another non-negative number, and the result is negative. Can that happen? Yeah, two minus three is a negative one. That can happen, sure. Okay, not a problem. Um, we have a, uh, a non-negative value to begin with. We subtract a negative value from it, and the result is non-negative. Yes, absolutely, right? You know, this is the only way it, can, it should happen. So absolutely a yes over here. And what about this one? We have a non-negative value minus a negative value, and we end up with a negative value. Does it make sense? No, it does not make sense. Okay, we'll kind of highlight it and say absolutely not, okay? So I'm gonna fill up the rest of the table, okay, without full explanation because you, know, you can you can work out the details, okay? You know, because if you can work out the first three rows and the first four rows, you, know, you can work out, work out the rest. So this makes sense, this makes sense, and so on. So now we have a table, and instead of asking does it make sense, I'm gonna change the question. I'm gonna change the question of do we have an overflow, okay? Because you know, when the answer is a no here, or when it does not make sense, that means you know, we have an overflow. So what I'll do is, I'll just you know, kind of copy and paste this entire table, and this time I change the question of do we have an overflow? So overflow, oops, question mark, and all I have to do is to flip the answer here. Okay, so we have no, oops, not, nope, nope, yes, yes, nope, nope, there we go. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, let me scroll the screen a little bit. Are we doing okay so far with this table? Because an overflow is the only reason why it doesn't make sense. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So are we doing okay so far with this table? All right. So now the question is, can I make a equation or an expression to determine whether we have an overflow or not? So I want to do an overflow, okay? So I'm gonna call it OV because the O uppercase O looks like a zero. I don't want it to look like a zero. So I want to use OV as overflow. So the question is, how can I derive an equation to come up with a one if and only if the overflow is actually happening? So the answer to that question is, we only got two rows here that ends up with a one here. 
So that means I can look at this big pattern and look at this particular big pattern, and I want to make an, a conjunction for each one so that the conjunction is a one if and only if we're talking about that row. So I'm going to focus on one at a time. So let's focus on just this row here. So what kind of Boolean expression as a conjunction is true but if and only if x uh, m minus 1 is a 0, y m minus 1 is a 1, and b m minus 1 is a 1? Mm, no, I want a conjunction. <laughs> I want a conjunction. That is true if and only if the most significant bit of x is a 0, the most significant bit of y is a 1, and the most significant, most significant bit of b is also a 1. Okay, I'll give you the answer, okay? Yep, that's it. Okay, so I heard the answer from, you know, kind of back there. Um, so we basically want to negate um, x of m minus 1 and then end it with um, y of m minus 1 and then end it with d of m minus 1. Um, it's complaining about curly braces because I mistyped this one. There we go. All right. So if you look at this expression, are you convinced, looking at just this row over here, are you convinced that this is going to be a 1, but only for that particular row? For all the other rows, it's going to be a 0. Is that OK? Because it is specifically looking for a value of 0 for x m minus 1. It's specifically looking for a value of 1 for y of m minus 1, and also a 1 for d of m minus 1. The, the entire table only has one row that meets all the requirements. Is that OK? So now we look at this and go like, but that's not the only row that has an overflow. We have the next row, which is also overflow. Well, we just worked out another conjunction like this to handle the other row. Okay, so that's going to be okay. You know, and I'm going to put a mystery operator here, you know, because we don't know how to combine those two. But we're going to work on the other one. So the other one specifies oh, okay, x of m minus one is not negated because it is a one, but the other two are negated. So we have and the negation of y of m minus one and the negation of d of m minus 1, OK? All right. So now we have the second conjunction handling the second row where there is an overflow. Are we doing OK with that? Now, I'm not going to ask you guys to derive these expressions. So I'm working, you know, I'm, I'm the one working out the expressions. Your job is to understand the expression, okay, and apply it. You know, when is it useful, what it is for, okay? That is going to be on your side. But the derivation of the expression is on my side. Are we good so far? All right. So now the question is, what do I use as an operator to combine this, the result of this conjunction and the result of this conjunction here? Because overall, you know, I'm, what I want is I want overflow as a Boolean value to be a 1 whenever the sign of the difference does not make sense. Or you, know, you can also say whenever there's an overflow situation. So it looks like we have two ways to cause an overflow, right? Because there are two rows in the truth table where you know, the overflow is a 1. So what do we use as an operator to combine the results of the conjunctions? Yep, a regular or would do, okay? So in this case, you know, the weird thing is if you use exclusive or, it would also work, but you know, we don't want to use that. We'll just specify a regular or. So these symbols, okay, you know, the negation sign here, the conjunction and the disjunction, those were all introduced in the very first class of this entire semester, which means that might need to be on the list of definitions you know, on your notes, you know, in the, in, you know, everything being at the same place. Are we good so far with this? Okay. And that's it. That's how overflow is defined. So now that we know what is overflow, and we also know one, one more thing from an observation earlier. 
the observation from earlier is the, o, the sine bit is wrong if and only if there's an overflow situation. Okay? Now, did I prove that is always the case? No, I do not. But can we say that we have an observation of that being the case? Okay? I think we can make a case that yes, we have an observation. Whenever there's an overflow, the sign is wrong. But whenever there's not an overflow, yes, we can just rely on the sign flag itself and go like, okay, that indicates whether the x, whether the unsigned, excuse me, whether the signed value of x is less than the signed value of y. So now we have a classic situation, okay, where one person always tells the truth and the other person always lies, okay? But you cannot tell which one is lying and which one is telling the truth, okay? So I ask a question where the answer can only be a yes or no. So let's just say that, you know, okay, I'm using you as an example here. <laughs> so uh, between you and me, uh, one of us is always gonna lie, the other one is always gonna tell the truth. And you are the one who is actually providing the answer, okay? So when someone asks me, say, hey, Tech, um, is today a good day to goof off and you'll skip a class? And then I would ask you the same question, and then you would ask the actual authoritative you know, of whether today is a good day, good, good day to skip a class. But between you and me, one of us is always going to lie. The other one is always going to tell the truth. So to the person who asked me you know, whether today is a good day to skip a class, what do you think that person has to do? The answer is always going to be the opposite, because one of us is always going to lie. Is that okay? So what if I have a flag that tells me whether one of us is going to lie or not? I think I posed the question in the wrong way. I think it is still the right way. Okay, I, I have to think about how to present it. Okay, a truth table works. Okay, let me let me go to a truth table again, and you can start to see you know, the value of a truth table. Okay. Okay, so we have the sign bit. Okay, this is x uh, d of m minus one, and I want to put this in the equation. So it can be a zero or one. We have the uh, overflow flag. Which can also be you know, zero or one, and then we want to know whether x is actually less than y. So I'm going to use d, okay, d underscore s x m is less than d of s uh, y of m. All right, so I'm going to turn this into a table. There we go. So assuming that the most significant bit or the sign bit of the difference and the overflow bit are independent, okay? That's an assumption, okay? They are not actually independent, but we'll just say that they are independent. So we have, they're both true, they're both false, and I want to know, in that case, is it actually less than? Um, if the sign bit is a zero and it is an overflow situation, is the result actually less than? And then the opposite would be these. So I want you guys to fill in the question marks in this table based on what we have talked about so far. So we will we'll work on one row at a time. The first row is basically saying the sign bit of the difference is telling us that it is not the case, okay? The case is not less than one. We do not have an overflow situation. So now the question is, is ds of xm actually less than ds of y? No. No. So we put a zero or one? Zero. We put a zero. Okay, very good. So we'll go ahead and just do that. What about the second row? The second row says the most significant bit of the difference is a zero, which usually would tell us that x is not less than y, but we confirm that there's an overflow situation. What does overflow mean? it messes up the sign bit, which means what should have been a one is observed as a zero. So you know, the question is, is x less than y in this case? Yeah. It is, very good. What about this scenario? We do not have an overflow, you know, the difference is properly representing the correct value, 
And that proper value has assigned it being one, which means uh, the difference is negative. So if the difference is in fact negative, is x less than y? Yes. Okay. So we put a one over here. And then we have the one last row. We know we have an overcrossing condition, which causes the sign flag of the difference to be incorrect. There's only one way for it to be incorrect, which means in this case, it should have been a zero, but we observe a one. But we have an overflow here, so the one should have been a zero. So do we have a situation where x is less than y? No. Okay, so we have a zero. So now we look at this table, okay, and we go like, okay. So I want I want you guys to do this. Cross out or ignore the header of the entire table. Look at the rest of the table. Do you recognize this table? It's like, heck, this is like the third time we see something like this, okay? The first time was the binary R function for addition. The second time was the R function in binary for subtraction. Okay, addition, subtraction, and this is the third time we see this. Is there a single operator that I can use to say, oh, I think we know how to relate you know, whether something is less than with the most significant bit of D, the difference, and the overflow. What is that operator? Exclusive or, very good. So I'm gonna introduce a few more you know, symbols here. They're really just for convenience because you know, typing D subscript M minus one is not easy, okay? We'll just call it the sign flag, which is abbreviated to, abbreviated to S. And then on the other side, this thing here, I'm just calling it the L flag, okay? So the L flag is really just a Boolean value that reflects whether the sign interpretation of X is indeed less than the sign interpretation of Y, okay? Just so that I don't have to type a crazy amount of stuff, you know, in the actual equation. So now I can try to give you the final form, which is, okay, um, how do we define L? Okay, I will let you guys help me do this. L is, okay, somebody already mentioned the correct operator. What operator was it again? Exclusive or, okay, so exclusive or is a, uh, plus inside the O, that's why it's called an O plus. And then we just have signed on one side and overflow on the other side. And that's it. So now combining the sign of the difference and whether we have an overflow situation, now we can always reliably tell whether X is less than Y after a subtraction. Is that okay? So this part here, okay, you know, in Joplin, you know, you guys can, I can give you the Joplin code, by the way. So if you want it, you know, I can send you the um, markdown code. All you need to do is to copy and paste it into Joplin, which is an open source free program. Then you can have everything back here, okay? So in addition to the recording, which is actually going, <laughs> I know, you know, some people probably skip a bit, you know, in terms of the heartbeat because it's like, don't tell me that we forgot to record this entire thing. No, we actually recorded this entire thing. But in addition to this, I can give you the whole thing, okay? You know, all, everything in here today, I can give you all of this, okay? Which does not take the part of your notes, okay? Because this is the way I present the information. You might have a different way that you want to go like, okay, I don't like this presentation. I want to kind of change the things a little bit, you know, put this definition over here, explain this in words over here. So take this as the source document, but use it to make your own notes, okay? Um, okay, so getting back to the uh, final interpretation here. See the green area? Okay, let's let's check it out. Instead of using OV, I just use an uppercase O, but it, since it's slanted, it is not easily seen as a zero. But look at this, okay? Look at this and go like, heck, but that's not what we talked about. Well, when something looks like a multiplication, it is a conjunction. The exclamation point is the negation, and the plus is the disjunction. Okay, so those are the alternative notations, typically used by computer science people, and mostly by computer engineers. So I'm changing the notation a little bit here just so that it's easier to, to read without all the 
wedges and the fees and whatnot. So that's something that you might want to write down. Okay, you know, the notation is a little bit different here because you know I just want to make it easier to type. So what looks like a multiplication is a conjunction. What looks like an addition is a disjunction. And the exclamation point is a negation. Is that okay? It really means the same thing as what we see here, except you know, the notation is a little bit different. Question? Huh? Multiplication is the same as a conjunction. I can actually put it here um, also. Okay. So I'll just you know, use this to explain the alternative notation. So x, y is the same thing as x and y x plus y is the same thing as x or y. And then finally, not x or negation, oh, okay. Exclamation x is the same as the negation of x. And I'll even put in the extra stuff here, okay? Well, I'll put in the, the C notation. So this is x ampersand ampersand y. And then this one is x or y in C, and then this is the same as, um, well, this one is easy because it's just exclamation X. Is that helping? Okay, all right. So I think we have covered enough for today's lab. Okay, so today's lab is all about this material. It will just ask you what is the overflow flag, what is the sign flag, is it less than or not, that sort of stuff. So let me go ahead and unlock the homework assignment. I didn't take road today, you know, that's okay, you know, because you know, whether people can do the lab or not, I think that's an indicator whether they're actually in class or not. So we'll go ahead and go to the lab. Where did I put this? This is the right class. There we go. Okay. Unlock this. And I thought I set the time already. Maybe I forgot. Nope, I got I did set the time. Okay. So it should be you should be able to access it now. The access code is flags. That's your access code. Oh, it says I haven't published. All righty. So it is published now. I could just confirm it. You know, go ahead and try to get in. Um, the access code is flags, F L A G S, all in lowercase. Can someone confirm? Yep. The note that I typed during class? Does anyone want to get this note here? You know, like just what I type in markdown? Okay, yes. Oh, yes, you're confirming yes. Yeah, okay. So let me do that. Okay, edit, select all, copy. Today is 0912. Okay. All right. All right, so I am sending today's note in markdown format. Uh, 
in an announcement. There you go. It's in the announcement. And then I will just upload the video recording. <laughs> 